I have never been afraid of hearing no. Doesn't hurt my ego, not a big deal. I'm not afraid of you saying no to me. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son, Troy, each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. Will Kane, thank you for joining us today. I know you're busy flying to and fro from Dallas, where your family is, and New York City, where your job with Fox News takes you every weekend for Fox and Friends. We got connected through our mutual friend, Brian Kilmeade, so we'll try not to disappoint. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure I will not be disappointed. I'm glad to be here. I'm honored to be here. Thank you, Tim and Troy. Will, we like to get the entire story of our guests. So let's go back to when you were a kid growing up in Texas. What did your parents do? What was your town like? Did you have any siblings? And what are your favorite memories of your childhood? Tim, I'm from Sherman, Texas. It's a small town about an hour, 60 miles north of Dallas. The urban sprawl and remarkable growth that's come to Texas hasn't quite yet, but will soon reach my hometown of Sherman. It was about 30,000 people. It's probably now grown to 40,000 people. My mom was a homemaker. My dad was an attorney. Um, He was primarily a plaintiff's attorney, uh, but in a small town, you do a little bit of everything from criminal defense to civil defense to plaintiff's work. Uh, My dad had the office right across from the courthouse in Sherman, Texas. So I remember two things and how how those might have helped form into who I am. I remember going down to my dad's office and on a few occasions getting to go into the courtroom and listening to my dad argue a case and then applying that with my second takeaway here is at the dinner table almost every night. It was not, hey, how's your meal? What What's the weather like? It was debating the issues, whatever it was from whether or not McDonald's has the best hamburger down to the um, odor placed in natural gas in order to ensure that someone smells it and you won't have a house explosion. I mean, we debated. That's what we did. So later in life, when I found myself sitting, you know, at a table with Stephen A. Smith debating whatever. I felt right at home. Other people like shy away. Oh no, you know, this is confrontational. I was like, I feel right at home. Um, I have three siblings. I'm one of four. I'm the oldest of four, probably also a big part of my personality. And we grew up, um, outside of Sherman. So on about seven acres, but surrounded by more country than that. And, you know, my memories are that, it was probably a pretty standard small town Americana existence. I mean, I got to live in the country so I could, you know, shoot clays and skeet in my backyard with a hand thrower and explore the woods and, and do all that, ride my bike to my friend's house. But, um, you know, I would say the other thing, and it's been a big part of my life in the past year professionally is we would spend every summer going to Hawaii as a family. It was just forced togetherness time for all six of us. And, um, I spent a month in Hawaii and uh, I have a deep love to this day and uh, for, for Maui. And when there was those fires last summer in Lahaina that destroyed really the entire city, I'm saying this is where it came back into my professional life. Um, I just had to do something. So, uh, you know, I'm really honored that Fox got behind me, but we raised two and a half million dollars, $2.6 million. And we gave out over uh, $210,000, $12,000 grants to families that lost their homes. So when I think about my childhood, those are sort of the two places and the people that I think of. You're listening to Tim Green's Nothing Left Unsaid. If you're enjoying this episode, please consider liking and subscribing to support us. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. What about high school? I was reading about you doing water polo in college. 
Was there a water polo team at your high school? Also, did you have any aspirations about being a conservative television personality at that time? Let's deal with high school and sports first. They did not have water polo in Sherman, Texas. And I feel like water polo has become, instead of a badge of honor, a punchline to my athletic career because I own my humility. Um, I got to water polo at Pepperdine University by starting competitive swimming when I was probably six or seven years old. I remember my mom took me, we had it, we had a, uh, a, a competitive clubs program in Sherman. And I remember she took me and I think that my best friend, my entire life, uh, his mother took him. And I remember watching the practice. So let's go watch it. And I remember whoever the friend was I had was already on the team got done. And I think he was crying afterwards. And I was like, I don't, I definitely do not want to do this. I don't want to do this. And yet, um, I think my mom wasn't a strong swimmer growing up. So she resolved herself to making sure I could swim. So I was like an infant swim and all of that through my entire life. And I guess pretty young, I proved to be fairly fast. And, and so, yeah, I ended up on the swim team as did my best friend, which is key. Not, not a, that's not an extra detail because swimming is lonely. It is not fun. You know, you don't get to talk while you're swimming. You, you're looking down at a black line. But the fact that I had my buddy with me the entire time made it so that I stuck with it all the way through 18. I, I was pretty good. I mean, I, I would never sit and say I was great. Um, I was probably good enough to swim in a small college somewhere. But I, I'm, I've been a sports fan since I was a kid, Tim. I mean, um, I am as probably anyone who's ever even heard of me knows, um, like, you know, a diehard Homer Dallas Cowboy fan. I'm a Dallas Stars, Texas Rangers, Texas Longhorns. And importantly, as we speak, Dallas Mavericks fan. And I've always been keyed into team sports and I wanted to do something. I, I wanted to take what I had and apply it. So I walked on at Pepperdine uh, and Pepperdine is a top 10 oftentimes top five program in the country in water polo. And they were very generous with their walk-on program. And I was on the team for four years. I scored um, one career goal against the University uh, UC Santa Barbara. And I gave a hook'em horn sign when I scored. I hadn't yet even attended the University of Texas Law School, but I guess my future was written for me. Um, and that's my, that's my career in water polo. As to whether or not I wanted to be a, you know, conservative personality, radio or television. The answer to that is no. I wanted to be a sports broadcaster or a lawyer, one or the other. But, you know, I grew up like learning about Bob Costas and all these guys. I knew they all went to Syracuse and majored in sports journal, sports broadcasting. I majored in broadcasting, but I just didn't like it when I was studying it. I didn't love broadcasting as a study because I felt like I was learning how to be an actor, like read this prompter, do this. So at the end of college, I said, no, I'm going, I'm going to law school, which was really one of the smartest things I think I did. Because then I learned how to think and talk and be real. I didn't want to be an actor. I wanted to be authentic and real. And I learned what I really thought at law school at the University of Texas. What drew you to Pepperdine University? Partially, it was spending those summers in Hawaii. I think I'm 49 years old. I think in the 80s and 90s, California was a draw. California was cool. Like that's where Hollywood was. That's where the big cultural movement of America was. That's what was cool. So I had a little bit of a romanticization of California. And I had a lot of friends from California because of those summers in Hawaii. And so I, I applied and, and got into colleges all over, University of Texas, SMU, Northwestern, the Arizona schools. And then in California, I looked at USC and Pepperdine. And, um, the reason I applied to Pepperdine was I got the brochure in the mail. I mean, you, you, I mean, there it is right there on the ocean, right there on the beach. And I remember, um, we visited USC and Pepperdine on the same day. And, you know, we, you go to South central Los Angeles, you go through some guarded gates and you go into a beautiful campus at USC. And then later that day you go to the beach in Malibu. And my dad's like, why is this even a debate? I don't know why you would even consider USC versus Pepperdine. But what was important for me, what swung me was that day that I was visiting, two things. Pepperdine had just won the national championship in baseball. And I told you, you know, team sports and sports were a big, big thing for me. I needed something to root for. I remember watching them on TV at the College World Series. And 
that day, USC was playing Pepperdine in water polo. And I remember going down to the pool deck. I checked out of the campus tour, you know, where you're in a group and I left it because I knew they were playing each other. And I went down to the pool deck and the entire Pepperdine national champion baseball team was on the deck heckling the USC goalie from end to end. And I was like, this is pretty cool. This is like a good atmosphere camaraderie. And I, I, I ultimately, I got an academic scholarship, which influenced it, but I chose to go to Pepperdine. And by the way, uh, really quickly, what's interesting about what's changed in the eighties and nineties is California isn't so cool anymore. Now I meet all these California kids and they're coming to Texas. They're all going to TCU. Especially the last few years, right? Since COVID. Yeah, exactly. After you graduated with a degree in telecommunications in 97, you went back to Texas, this time for law school. How did that come about? Well, this has sort of been my relationship with my home state, which I am a huge, um, I don't know, Texan. Like, wh you know, whichever way Texas goes, I go. But that is a love that I have. It's a bit like a girlfriend that you have dated off and on throughout your life. I've left and I've come back. I've left and I've come back for adventure. Um, you know, and you may ask me about this later, but I, I go away to college. I come back for law school. I go away after law school and live in Montana. I come back and get married in Texas. My wife and I go away and move to New York, live there for an entirely too long, 15 years. And now we're back in Texas and I don't intend to leave this time, but, um, I wanted to come home. I wanted to come back to Texas and I, you know, I applied to law schools, uh, all across Texas and university of Texas is the best law school in the state of Texas. So I was excited to go to Austin and, and be a longhorn. Did your dad's career make you want to be a lawyer? Or is that kind of always something you thought about growing up? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, I think my personality is naturally inclined in that direction. I like rhetoric. I like logic. I like arguing. I like philosophy. I like understanding the law. Um, but I'd be lying if, you know, I didn't romanticize what my dad did. If I didn't idolize it, uh, what my dad did and watching him argue in those courtrooms or even seeing him sit behind his desk at his, his law office was always like the proudest I ever was of my dad. So yeah, I'm in no, in, in no small part, probably chasing my dad. When you graduated from law school, you went off to work on a ranch and also wrote a book. Please tell us about the book and how in the world you ended up on a ranch. Well, I'm much more happy to tell you about my year in Montana than the, the book that I wrote while I was in Montana. First, let me tell you why I went to Montana. So first of all, I didn't want to grow up. I did not want to go and, you know, be a lawyer after law school. And, and again, it's not that I didn't love law school or the law. It's it's probably a factor of this. And Tim, you're a lawyer and you may have had the same experience, but I grew up around lawyers and it's really odd how many lawyers don't want to be lawyers. <laughs> like eight out of 10 lawyers seem to be unhappy with being lawyers and looking for some other way to make a living than being an attorney. And I sort of saw that warning. I sort of saw that. That's interesting. And I think I would have been really happy to pursue the law, but it felt a little bit for me, like hitting a double and the way that I've always been geared. And this probably goes back to my dad a little bit, being a plaintiff's attorney where you, you eat what you kill. Um, you know, you don't win the case, you don't make any money that I've been a little bit geared towards home runs. Like it's home run or strike out. So I'm going to go for it, whatever it is that I want. And I'm not going to settle for the double as I've gotten older and wiser. I've learned the, the value of being Kirby Puckett you know, Tony Gwynn racking up singles throughout a career can lead to the hall of fame. But, um, I, uh, I thought my dream might be to be a writer. And if I was going to do that, then I wanted to go someplace that, that, that was an adventure. And I'd say there's two things that led me to Montana. One lonesome dove. It's my favorite book in mini series from the early nineties with Robert Duvall and Tommy Lee Jones. And they, they drive a cattle herd North to Montana and the second was a book that was written by John Steinbeck called Travels with Charlie. And Steinbeck loads his dog up, Charlie, and they drive across the country. And he gets to Montana and he says, if you had taken a boy from, say, Washington, D.C., who'd never been to Texas, to describe for you Texas, 
what he would in reality describe would end up being Montana. So I was like, well, <laughs> I've got to go to Montana. Um, I went up there. I met some of the most wonderful people in my life. They took me in. They're my second family. Um, I lived not directly on their ranch, but not far. I lived on a trout stream and I worked on their ranch. They were a hunting outfitter primarily. So I took care of mules and horses. And, and then I spent the rest of my time writing a book. And the book, which I don't love talking about because I don't even... I, it's not a, a great source of pride. Um, was like a coming of age tale. It was... Um, not autobiographical, but uh, a bunch of 25 year old dudes trying to figure out what to do with their life. Come, you know, I think Oprah used to talk about the quarter life crisis, you know, but like it was about four guys living in Austin, Texas, trying to figure out what they were going to do with their life. In the book, look, I got an agent. I thought that was the big finish line. You get an agent, that means you get it published, but um, it wasn't the finish line. It didn't get published. And I'm actually happy it didn't get published. And I have no intention of letting anybody else read it or describing it in any more detail with you here today, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get connected with the family in Montana? Like, did you, did you know them before or? No, I knew a guy from my hometown of Sherman who had moved up to this area of Montana. Uh, it's about 30 miles east of Missoula. It's called Rock Creek. And, uh, so I went up there and he was sort of a target and I didn't really have a, if I'd loved Wyoming, I would have stayed in Wyoming, but I, I just like, I'll just keep going. So I went up, met him, liked the area. And then I found a classified ad. Troy, you won't know anything about that, but classified ads were little advertisements in the newspaper, you know, for a, a place to rent. And I had a dog and I, you know, I got, I got this Doberman who was my best friend when I was like 20 years old. And he was my constant companion. I mean, I took him to the college parties. He went with me everywhere in law school and he moved to Montana with me, but he was a Doberman. And uh, they have a reputation and he's, you know, he looks a little scary. He wasn't. Um, and, but I answered the ad for this cabin for rent. And it was this lady, she was probably 80 years old. And I, and I went and she's like, oh, my son, my son says, uh, I can't rent to you with a Doberman. You know, it's a scary dog. And I said, well, you got to meet my dog. And so I knocked on her door and there was my dog and he was awesome guys. I mean, I gave a command and he followed and he was just, he was solid. Uh, and I won her over. And then she said, my son, um, has a ranch. Do you know horses? And I said, yeah, a little bit. And I ended up working for a son who was at that time in his fifties. And, uh, and they, they took care of me for a year in Montana. Then tragedy struck. Your father died suddenly and you returned to Dallas. Is it fair to say that you wanted to be a role model for your younger brother? Yeah. I mean, it's fair to say that I wanted to be, I mean, I would never, I would never give myself that compliment that I was capable of becoming, um, his role model. Yeah. As I mentioned, I'm the oldest of four. My youngest brother's 10 years younger than me. So I was living in Montana and my dad died and, um, and my youngest brother was 15. He was still in high school. And, and well, I told you a minute ago that, you know, I probably didn't want to grow up. No, I didn't have a choice. It's time to grow up. And, um, and so I did. And I didn't know when I would move back from Montana or if I'd move back. Um, but now it was obvious. Uh, yeah, I'm coming back home. I moved back home, um, stayed in the house for a year. And I don't know, I don't know how valuable my presence was for my brother or not, but, um, I continued to work on that book and then, um, started to develop the idea that, it, you know, writing a book's a pretty hard way to make a living, but I do love being in media. I do love being in in that case, publishing, I started to study media and put into place a plan for, for, um, what would eventually lead us to where we are today, but through a lot of different twists and turns, it sort of was, all right, let's get serious, um, about life. Did something happen when you were home that made you change your mind to media or did it just kind of a natural evolution? You think? I think it was a natural evolution that, that, being a novelist uh, and um very well aware I'm a, sitting here with a very successful novelist but being a novelist is a very very difficult thing to you know set out to achieve and the reason why and this is probably my biggest frustration 
throughout my life, my career is the limited amount of control that you had. You have more now with self-publishing, but a lot of gatekeepers that you need um, to convince in order to get something published back then. And, um, you know, I remember when I was in law school, I worked, I clerked for a law firm that did criminal defense. And I remember sitting there writing a memo or a brief for this attorney. And I just remember sitting there going, the entirety of my success or failure rests on whether or not this guy likes my brief that I wrote here in the next couple of minutes. And I didn't like that feeling. I liked succeeding or failing on my own terms. So, um, so I wanted to just find ways, Troy, to, to get a little more control and be a little more entrepreneurial about my career. And what I did is in that time, I read a couple books, um, biographies of Warren Buffett, um, and then a guy named Al Newharth, who started the newspaper USA Today. And I started to realize the value, even though it was beginning to already decline, but to realize the value of newspapers. And I was, by the way, I, I love newspapers. I read newspapers my whole life. Dallas Morning News, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, whatever I could get. And so I was like, I think this is a path I could go. I could go small town newspapers and um, I could scratch that itch of writing and entrepreneurship and media altogether. Do you think the quality of news from when you were reading it, kind of small town news growing up to today, do you think that quality is the same, better or worse? Well, I think quality is less of an influential factor than quantity. There's just such a quantity of news. So yeah, there's a lot of low quality stuff out there. But with the quantity available to everyone, um, you can find valuable information. You just have to work harder. And it doesn't come, in my mind, it doesn't come with granted credibility of a banner. So because it has the New York Times at the top, doesn't make it true or good. Because it has any brand at the top, doesn't make it true or good. So you have to work hard to be like, who is this person is writing this? Um, what perspective are they coming from? And you can filter, you have to filter. You have to become your own editor on, on quality. And then one other thing Oof. about the novelist part of you, do you still, is that still something you, you want to do and still something you're working on? Well, yes. I'm not going to lie to you in no small part because everybody at Fox writes a book. Uh, and it's a great place to work if you ever want to write a book. Um, what I don't want to write, and this has been my big hang up and sooner or later I just got to move forward. I don't, I'm not that interested in writing Will's view on the world. You know, my analysis of American politics or culture, maybe someday, but you know, I, I, I look real, um, I admire what Bill O'Reilly has managed to put together with killing Lincoln, killing Kennedy, killing Patton, you know, making history digestible and in a series where people keep coming back. I'm a big fan of James A. Mishner. I don't know if you guys ever read Mishner, but I love local history. I love, I love when I, when I love the United States of America, I really focus on the States part. I love the United States of America and how different we are from our accents to our culture and our history. Mishner would write these tomes, right? On Texas or Hawaii or Colorado. That one was called Centennial. And I just am kind of like thinking out loud with you, Troy, like things that I kind of want to do or what I might want to write, but sure. something in that vein more than just 300 pages of my opinion on the world. Will, the, one of the things that's interesting is the, the kind of the gatekeeper you talked about with writing books. And today in the media, it seems like that's pretty much just gone now with people just going direct to, I mean, really, even like this podcast, right? There is no big production company and had to get approved by executives. We just started recording in front of a camera. Is that, a, you know, is that, I guess, part of your, part of what you like about the media side is, is that kind of direct to consumer? Obviously, Fox is, is one of the big players and ESPN previously is, but you always could kind of do your own, your own show and all that. Yeah. And I think that's a good thing for media. This is back to the quantity. Um, it doesn't mean everything that comes out without a gatekeeper is going to be good. A lot's going to be really bad. Um, but I had a guy on my show, the Will Cain show, say, call it, you know, the democratization of information makes it a net positive. Because um, we've seen, we've seen the, the ideological bent, the agenda-driven um, notion of various gatekeepers. And so 
what you're seeing happen in media is more and more, even those inside want to have a presence outside the gate. So, you know, while I'm still inside the garden, inside the gate uh, at Fox, you know, I've put a lot of effort into the Will Kane show, which streams on YouTube and Facebook and is a podcast as well. It's live every day. And um, it's not inside the gate of the terrestrial television station. And mm-hmm. and that's real important to me. It's real important to my, not just my career, but just like being able to do what I want to do. And, and the other example I'd point to is, you know, Stephen A. Smith at ESPN. You know, he's he's ESPN guy, but he's also starting to build the Stephen A. Smith show or podcast or digital show. And not unlike Pat McAfee, who's really a guy many people have looked at and said, oh, that's the pioneer in what you want to create. We all want to have a little more direct to consumer relationship. Do you think those guys like the like take Pat McAfee as an example? He uses his um, outside outside of the gate, right, and creates this huge show, and then basically, um, you know, sells and goes inside the gate. Do you think that's the future of it? Do you think people you build up the proof of concept now isn't a pilot episode? Do you think the proof of concept is you kind of have to do it on your own, and then once you get the following, you go inside the, the bigger companies? Well. I think, for example, I'm doing it the opposite way. I'm attempting to build it inside the company, and both have their both have their um, challenges and and benefits. Great, what Pat's done, great. Um, and I know that Pat had opportunities to join ESPN before he launched his own thing, and mm-hmm. and could have, and he would have undersold himself. But the unique circumstance as well for Pat is that ESPN needed to find some way to get into that audience, a younger audience, a digital audience. And big, big corporations have a hard time creating things. So they have to go out and acquire it. I don't think that will be the model for everybody. I think there will be increasing ability to be self-sustaining. But we should say, like, that market's not as great as everybody thinks it is. Otherwise, Pat wouldn't have gone to ESPN, you know? Um, There's a reason he went to ESPN. And, you know, there are people clearly that make money independently and do well and reach big audiences. But they are the exception, not the rule. Um, and then I'm the guy over here beating his head against the wall inside the big corporation looking to build the new media company. My money is on you to make that a big success. Going back to when you came back to Texas, things seemed to take a more entrepreneurial turn. You started buying up some Texas newspapers and even started a few of your own. A short time later, you sold those to a conglomerate. Where did that idea come from? Was it a class at Pepperdine? Definitely not. I got the idea during that time spending reading about people who'd actually built media companies. And, you know, you don't just go buy a television station. You don't just go buy a radio station. These are licensed. These are licensed businesses. So unless you get big financial backing, it's not sort of your entree into, into media entrepreneurship. Now, of course, everybody would be doing it in digital, but I had read about newspapers. And so Warren Buffett, was one of the guys I'd mentioned um, was an influence in this way, talked about what a great business newspapers were um, were in the past. And, and it, they had huge margins, um, very little capital investment, and somewhat of a captured market. So um, I wanted to go into, and I had studied more, small town newspapers, weekly newspapers, into towns of like 5,000 people, 10,000 people, 2,000 people. And so, um, yeah, that's, I went and moved to the hill country of Texas, had a law degree, making $19,000 a year. All my buddies were making over a hundred thousand dollars a year at that time as attorneys. And I was delivering newspapers and I was covering city health, city council. And I was covering the high school football game, but I was learning the business because I knew at that small level, I could see every aspect of it, every part of the business. I did that for a year. And then I borrowed money from a bank and I bought um, people were already beginning to talk about the decline of newspapers. So I had two areas that I was going to go into to insulate myself from decline. One, um, small town newspapers in a growth path. So I bought newspapers North of Dallas. Dallas is growing really expansively North. So I bought into two communities. I started a third and a fourth and I did end up selling those to the owner of the daily newspaper in Sherman, which is a big conglomerate out of Arkansas and, and Las Vegas. Um, and 
then I wanted to go the other the other um market that was growing that I thought I'd go into is the Latino market. So I started a my second entrepreneurial thing in media was to start a um magazine website and event company uh for quinceañeras. I don't know if anybody knows what that is. Uh and I didn't, to be honest, but um, my wife's from West Texas, grew up around uh, a lot of Hispanics. And I knew I wanted to go because it's a growing market into that market. But what I learned is, you know, Hispanic is a government census created term. It just kind of lumps everybody together. Doesn't matter if you're from Argentina or Mexico. Doesn't matter if you're an immigrant or you've been here for five generations. So um, I was like, well, what, 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 what's a commonality? It's not soccer, by the way, because anybody from the Caribbean, like Cuba or whatever, they're into baseball. So I was just looking for some cultural tie. And my wife made me aware of quinceañeras, which is when a young girl turns 15. She has like a big party, big coming out, like a bat mitzvah or a wedding. And so my second entrepreneurial venture was to create a company catering to the planning of a quinceañera. How did that do? Not as well. Um, <laughs> the, the, the newspaper business went well for me financially. Um, this was a bigger undertaking and I raised capital and I mean, it did well in the beginning and, um, what it's a tight niche that I'm targeting here. And when is like 2008, 2009 recession comes along and people start paring back budgets. The good thing about small niches is that big conglomerates don't have the ability to come at attack and compete, but their margin for a downturn is also super small. I also will say I made plenty of my own entrepreneurial mistakes, but uh, no, that one didn't go as well. And the fact that it didn't go well is why I'm doing what I am now. Like after that failed, uh, I had to ask myself, well, what am I going to do next? And I thought, well, I've made money and I've lost money. And the only real difference is how I spend my every day. And do I wake up passionate and care about doing this? And for me, the answer when it came to quinceañeras was no. And I've made this joke several times, but like, if the answer were yes, then you'd want to put me on an FBI watch list. Like my passion isn't 15 year old Latinas. <laughs> so I said, whatever I do next, let's just make sure I'm excited every day to wake up and do it whether or not I succeed or fail. When did you begin working at CNN as a fill-in host? Were you in Atlanta? So the way, Tim, that came about was, um, in the meantime, my wife and I had moved to New York. We had decided, you know, at some point in your life, you have to live in New York City. We went up there on a six-month lease. I ended up staying, we ended up staying 15 years. And both of my sons were born in New York City. But again, I had only ever been an entrepreneur, but I knew I was one to be in media. and. I thought I want to do something in television. So my idea was, um, I'll create a television pilot. I didn't think what I saw on television was very good for the types of things that were happening in the country. I thought Barack Obama versus John McCain was a real choice for America. And, and I didn't think that the types of things I was seeing on TV was doing a service to what was a real ideological divide. And so I created a television pilot. And my idea was, I'm going to get two lefties and two righties. We're going to sit under a decompressed environment of like coffee or food and we're going to debate it. And I did that. And I rented out a diner in New York and got these guys, some of whom have gone on to big television careers like Chris Hayes of MSNBC to come do my television pilot. But look, news companies don't buy TV pilots. That's not what they do. So, but all it did was it established a relationship for me with National Review the conservative magazine. And I said to national review, I will do video interviews and series for you. And they were like, well, we don't have any budget. And I said, well, I'll do it for free. If you'll introduce me to everybody, you know, in television. And they introduced me to a handful of people. And one of them was Bill shine, who used to be an executive at Fox news. And Bill started putting me on Fox. My first ever television appearance was on Fox and Friends Weekend, the show I now host. And I, um, I w went on Fox and Friends. I went on Hannity and the Great American Panel. And I, you know, I probably did this for six months. And I, I put together a reel of appearances. And then one night, 
I guessed at his email address. Um, I, you know, I kind of researched it, but you could do first name dot last name at turner.com. And I sent an email to the president of CNN and said, you need somebody like me over at CNN and sent him that reel. And he responded within 15 minutes and said, you're right. Come in and see me. And, um, so I, I went in and saw him and next thing you know, I was on a pilot for a new show they were launching with the former governor of New York, Elliot Spitzer and Kathleen Parker, who was a Washington post columnist. And, um, you know, the, my thing on this, Tim and Troy is I've never, this is my thing. I've always said to people back to the strikeout home run. I have never been afraid of hearing no, doesn't hurt my ego. Not a big deal. I'm not afraid of you saying no to me, but I tell people this, make sure you take no from somebody who is empowered to say yes. Cause most people don't have the power to say yes. They only have the power to say no. They're those gatekeepers we're talking about. So that's why I went straight to the top of CNN. I'm like, you know, if he says yes, everybody underneath him all of a sudden is a yes. But all that did is get me an opportunity. And then the pilot, when I went and sat in on that, that was my at bat, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, it'll be a lack of humility, but it's going to be accurate. I knocked it out of the park. I mean, I crushed it. I, debated Elliot Spitzer in the same way I used to debate Stephen A. Smith. I went at it. It was substantive. It was intellectual. We hit it off in some ways on, on the personality level. And next thing you know, they said, we're going to sign you to CNN. And uh, I was there for five years. How did you get your gig at ESPN? So this part of my career story, I always find the least interesting, but the details are what people like. I, I think it's the least interesting because then, and Tim, you know this, and you're, then it starts to involve agents. You know, like now I've arrived at a level of my career where I have an agent and they play a role and it's less interesting. But I'll tell you how that worked is um, I was invited to guest host The View and it, it went really well. And then I was invited again. And then I was invited again. Before you know it, it had been like four times. And the then executive in charge of the view a guy named Bill Getty was like, I'm going to cast you on the view. Like that's the next season of the view, you know, you and Whoopi Goldberg and I don't know who else, Joy Behar. And I always liked being around people that disagree with me, you know? And I, I was like, this is going to be great. Like, I'll just go have it out on the view. And then I know now a lot of behind the scenes machinations that happened, but like that executive got fired. ABC and NBC did some executive swap and it dried up on me. For me at that time, I'm like, well, my agent didn't navigate those waters in the way that he should. And so, um, I looked, uh, I noticed Tony Rialli, who I know Tony now, and he hosts around the horn on ESPN at that time was doing good morning America as well. And I thought, yeah, look at that guy. He's doing sports and news. That's, that's, that's where I want to be. And, uh, I looked up who's his agent. So I found out and um made contact a guy named nick khan and nick and i've had uh our relationship has come and it's gone and now we're he's now the president of the wwe and we're friends and i had a, i actually really really appreciate nick he donated heavily to a gym in maui in lahaina he and uh, the rock did and dana white and um but nick was uh the biggest sports agent there was and he got me uh, I have to give him a ton of credit. I mean, he got me to ESPN. I got inside and a guy named Rob Savinelli, who was the talent director at ESPN. He bought into me as well. And that got me into ESPN. By the way, getting into ESPN is also just the start. Then you got to sell yourself to everybody in ESPN. Like, what are you going to do here? And I have to convince every show executive and every that, that I'm somebody they can use. And so the first six months to a year of being at ESPN was like, definitely proving myself. They had signed me. I was an employee. Then I had to prove myself that I was somebody that was valuable to ESPN. You were known as the lone conservative voice at ESPN. Where did you get your conservative values from? Or maybe the better question is, who did you get them from? So here's what's interesting. A lot of those kitchen table debates, my dad was a Democrat, but he was... Um, he was a Democrat out of necessity because I told you he was a plaintiff's attorney and in Texas, they were going through like serious tort reform, you know? And so like Republicans pushing tort reform, uh, he didn't want anything to do with that. Uh, <laughs> but I started to realize my conservative values in law school. 
when I really started to study the Constitution of the United States, and I have such great reverence for that document, the Declaration of Independence, and and then not not just that, the the founders. I, I, I you know, I, I recently took a trip to France with my family last week, and um, you know, we learned a lot about the French Revolution, and it's a failed revolution. And the fact that our revolution was a success, like a screaming success, is a testament to the genius of those men at that time. And it kills me at these people today, like, oh, you know, why are we beholden to men who've been dead for two or three hundred years? Those men were not just geniuses. They were full of wisdom. Like, and you know the difference between intellect and wisdom and the self-awareness and humility and George Washington declining his opportunity to remain and become king and checks and balances. It's just, it's all genius what happened in the United States of America in that time frame. And I started to understand it and realize it. in constitutional law, you see all these issues and you see them applied to modern day, modern day America. And then, um, I also read Ayn Rand. I was a big fan of Ayn Rand. And that also, um, informed my sort of conservative values that set me off down this path. And by the way, when I was at ESPN, I didn't think of myself as the lone conservative. I definitely knew I was alone, but, um, it didn't, for me, it, it was never supposed to be political. Like I really respected why the audience came to ESPN. I was just saying common sense stuff. Like I was like, this is like, why are you maligning half of America? And I felt like everybody else was getting incredibly political. And I was just pushing back on not being so political. I am conservative and I was always audience. Um, I was always honest with the audience. You have to be about your own biases and then move forward from a position of authenticity but it wasn't like I went out there to be the Republican on ESPN. I just was like, in my mind, being common sense. I wondered that. I wondered if that was part of like, they said to you, Hey, we want you to, you know, intentionally, intentionally, we want you to represent that side, but it no. like it was just, yeah. N well, what happened was they, I wasn't signed to ESPN because of these reasons. I was signed to ESPN because they thought I knew how to debate well. They may have been preparing for a day that Skip Bayless could leave. And they thought I was a dynamic personality on television. Then I had to prove to them I knew sports. But what happened was once I was there, everything else be went bananas with the election of Trump. And they all leaned into politics and they were all pretty much lockstep on their political opinions. And so then what happens is they all realize the executives wow, we're all saying the same things. And it's obviously pretty clear we're not talking to everyone in America. And I would argue you're not talking to a majority of America. And so then all of a sudden I became a voice of like, well, Will is somebody who's not just capable and does think differently, but Troy, you mentioned earlier, but I was willing to, like I was willing to say to everyone else, no, that's not the way it is. There are other people at ESPN that believe like me, or maybe like you guys, or how you, I'm not, I don't know your beliefs on everything, but there are definitely people who believe like me, but maybe not everybody always so willing to step into something that was a hundred to one. Well, you must feel like you were finally home now at Fox News. I do. It, I do. Um, and I'm going to tell you why. But it's not because now I'm in an environment where I have much more commonality and agreement with everybody. I'm at home in hot water. I'm at home around people telling me that I'm idiotic, that I'm wrong, and worse. Trust me, I have been called and am still called much worse. The most obvious when you, I was on ESPN is constantly being called a racist which I am not, <laughs> but I got very used to that. And I'm at home in that fire. I think it actually brings out the best in me. And I don't just mean pugilistically, but like thinking on my feet and feeling alive. So what makes me feel at home at Fox isn't that now I'm around people that all disagree or agree with me. It is in particular the show that I host, Fox and Friends Weekend. My two co-hosts, Pete Hegseth and Rachel Campos Duffy, are the best chemistry I've ever had in television. And chemistry is one of those things that everyone says they want to have and every executive thinks they can create, but it just happens. And when you have it, you need to recognize the moment. 
you know, obviously the best example of that, I think, is inside the NBA on TNT. Those guys are incredible because of their chemistry, Barkley and Shaquille and Kenny Smith and Ernie Johnson. I would say that I actually think Fox and Friends Weekend is second in television to the chemistry of, of inside the NBA. And those two are good friends of mine. I have ultimate respect for them. And they are the ones that are primarily responsible for making me feel at home. You've worked with a lot of huge names in, uh, in the media throughout your career. Is there somebody, aside from uh, chemistry, because obviously that's, that's a little different, but just in like the raw talent or people who you think just kind of got it, who are, the, who are the best people you've worked with, you think, or most talented people you've worked with in the media? Well, on, on the chemistry front, I've actually prided myself on that. And in that I take what I say very seriously, but I don't take myself seriously. And so that's why you're capable of like most of the time hearing the insults and whatever, or, or laughing at yourself if that's what the situation calls for. And so I've prided myself on establishing chemistry with any number of people. And I've had it. It's undeniable that I also had it with Stephen A. Smith and he with me. Um, and by the way, to answer your question directly, he would be among the most talented. He's incredibly talented. Um, he's not right all the time. I, maybe we even argue he's not right very often. But um, he, you know, I'll, I'm going to tell you, Stephen A., first of all, he knows that television is entertainment. He knows how to perform. That doesn't mean he fakes what he says. You know, that's not what, it's saying what you have to say in the most entertaining fashion fo possible. Um, and then surrounding yourself with people that, you know, will bring out the best of you or bring, make you, make you better. Um, and I think, I think Stephen A is in, incredibly, and he's a thinker and he's unpredictable and unpredictable and often wrong, but, but I think he is am, among the most talented. Um, yeah, man, I've, I, I've worked with Tucker Carlson, who I think is, is incredibly talented and, and smart, uh, and an original thinker. I think the same of my two co-hosts on Fox and Friends Weekend. I, uh, yeah, you're, you're right. I've had an opportunity to, to be around a lot of really talented people. With how busy you were, when and how did you meet your wife amid all your adventures? Well, she tells the story differently than I do. So, um, she went to Pepperdine. I went to Pepperdine. She tells the story that uh, one day, walking along dorm row there, she sees a t-shirt that says, don't mess with Texas, Texas Longhorn shirt. And she's from Lubbock, Texas. And she's like, oh, another Texan. And she says she chased me down. I was like, hey, hey, you're from Texas. I'm from Texas. And I was like, yeah. And then walked down some stairs on my way to the water polo pool. And if I told her, if that's what happened, and I don't remember this, but it's because I was kicking my can on the way down to practice to take another ego beating of humility on my way to water polo practice. Um, but I remember she was on the swim team. I was on the water polo team. Swim team would come onto the deck after we were done right at the end of our practice. And I, I noticed her, I'll tell you this, one of the initiations was, I don't think it is anymore, uh, in water polo. There's a couple of different things we had to do, but one of the initiations is after practice, we, um, would all go sit in the hot tub after practice and the women would take the pool and freshman year, uh, one at a time, not all at once, one or two at a time, they would get all the, they'd get the freshman down in the middle of the hot tub. It was a gigantic hot tub. And they would make him take his suit off. And then um, the whole team would get out of the hot tub at the same time, except for whoever was left naked in the hot tub. And then they would go and hang your suit on the high dive or put it on the flags over the pool. And so you had to get out of the hot tub, wait till everybody else got off the deck and walk across or jump in the pool if your suit was in the water, wherever they put it, while the girls swim team is all warming up. And just in your birthday suit, go get your suit and, and make your way back to the locker room. So that was the environment where I would have had to. But she was a freshman when I was a sophomore. So I would have gone through that initiation before she made her way to Pepperdine. But my memory is seeing her on the pool deck. Like many other people who are conservative and from Texas, am I correct in assuming that you identify as a Christian? Yes. Now, um... I love being real and having real conversations. So I grew up going to church every Sunday and going to youth group every Sunday night. Um, I would say there was a point in my life in my twenties when I over invested in intellectualism. Um, and when you asked me earlier, 
what brought me to conservatism, you'll notice my answer was through what I read or studied. Um, and I think that pulled me away from the value of faith. I literally invested in the idea that you should, you know, arrive at your positions in life through logic and reason. And I saw those as inherently antagonistic faith and reason. And, um, life has a way of humbling you, um, and bringing you more wisdom and understanding the limitations of intellectualism and making you realize the value of faith and your relationship with God. And as I've gotten older and then you have your own kids as well, which is incredibly humbling. Um, as, as I get older, my, my path back to God I always have been a Christian, but to really have a relationship with God has been a path back. And I, and I, and I, you're never, you're never there. You never arrive at perfection, but I'd like to think I'm on the right path. Um, in my, not just in Christianity, but in my relationship with God. Was it, was it when you had kids or something else, I guess, make you even think to start to work back towards that? Well, I have to say, I think the emotional prism through which you begin to find your way back to the necessity of faith is humility. And I think for a while I had not enough humility. And I'll just tell you, I don't know if this was the moment, but my oldest son, who's now 16, uh, when he was just shy of his third birthday, he went into the kitchen and he pulled a crock pot full of spaghetti sauce and meatballs off of the counter. And he spilled it all over the right side of his body. And so he suffered, uh, they don't do this anymore, but everybody knows it in these terms, third degree burns over 7% of his body. And um, he was in the hospital for a month and burn treatment back then, I think it's getting better, but you know, 10 years ago, it was, it's, it's awful. It, it's, it's, they, um, they do a thing called debridement or they did a thing called debridement twice a day. So they take you in and they try to scrub dead skin off your body, the burned skin to try to get down to healthy skin for it to grow back. And you had to, I had to hold my son down and you know, he's shot up with, you know, morphine and heroin and all, or not heroin, but morphine or uh, opioids or whatever they use back then. Uh, but he still feels it. And, um, at the end of three weeks, they, they're like, well, we can't, we can't get any. So they did skin grafts. They took skin from his head. He looked like he'd been scalped and they sewed it onto his chest and his arm and all this. And he's fine. Long short is he's fine, but it was rough for us and everybody has their thing. Right. And I don't want to compare my situation to anyone else's people go through much worse and they go through much worse with their children. But I'll tell you, Troy, it was humbling and, yeah, that's brutal, yeah. and it, and it, it was humbling in that you don't have it all figured out, Will, and reason's not going to walk you through all of this. And there is a reason people that go through things much worse than what you're going through need God. And I do think it was a helpful path, step on my path back to a relationship with God. One of my favorite pastors has a saying, if you were in a court of law, how difficult would it be to convict you of being a Christian? So since this is our podcast, I am obligated to provide some prima facie evidence to the prosecution that I am a Christian. Jesus himself was Jewish and said to love your neighbor as yourself, which includes every living person on this earth, which could sound dangerously liberal, couldn't it? I don't know. I don't know if it sounds dangerously liberal. Um, you know, it makes me think of something like, the concept of judgment. I think that a lot of the way American culture has evolved is that judgment is ugly. Judgment is full of hubris. Judgment is mean. And you shouldn't judge me. Don't judge me for this life choice. Don't judge me for this way that I am. But in truth, judgment is love. Judgment is telling someone that what you're doing that might not be the best thing for you or for us or for those around you. And it doesn't mean you stop to love them. It doesn't mean it's hate filled. It doesn't mean it has to be mean. It's, but it, it judgment is part of that. 
And um, I think in the same way, loving thy neighbor doesn't mean that we don't judge one another or we don't at times have to go to war against one another or we don't have to stand strong for principles. I don't think it always means you can't love your neighbor. And I think that, that I don't know that it, you know, that is antagonistic at all to conservatism. And by the way, Tim, I thought you were going to ask me to provide prima facie evidence that I am a Christian right standing before God. And I was like, Oh God, I'm not prepared to make my case. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to question you on some conservative issues. If you don't mind, there are no right answers. It's just what you think. And you can pass on any question you want. Okay. First question. If you were president, what would you do about the border and why? So first, top line, I mean, I would close the southern border, but I don't want to leave you with that answer because that's an easy thing to say and it's shallow. Um, so let's do why and then the hardest part is how. Why? Because if you don't have a border, you don't have a nation state. And we live in the age of a nation state. And we happen to have created the greatest nation state in the history of man, founded on the most incredible principles and values throughout human history. And that's worth fighting for. That's worth preserving. That's worth protecting. And a border is necessary to preserve that nation state, the United States of America. That nation state also has, as part of it, a although sometimes denied, undeniable culture. And you have to preserve that culture. And if you just have an open border, you know, you don't have any capability of preserving the culture that defines the United States of America. And there is a culture from the Protestant work ethic to, to the pioneer spirit to the manifest in modern day entrepreneurialism and risk-taking, frontiersmanship. There is a culture to America that has made this the greatest country, the greatest nation state experiment in the history of man. So it has to be preserved. That's the why. The how's the hardest part. But I, I think you can put the National Guard at the border. You can empower the states to do what they can, and you should empower the states um, and let the Supreme Court say that you have empowered them as the executive to enforce the border. And the truth is, then you've got to stop asylum asylum claims as the um the magic wand door into america you know the idea is we're going to accept asylum from people who are suffering from tyranny or oppression that's become economic tyranny and oppression that's bad life circumstances that's whatever and you brought up earlier love thy neighbor but you shouldn't have to love thy neighbor to the detriment of not just self but other neighbors so you have to stop all of this asylum claims. You have to be much more strict in what qualifies for asylum. Just to clarify for anybody who's listening, how do you feel about legal immigration? Well, I'm, I support legal immigration, but I don't, I don't, I think legal immigration is also something that actually should be discussed and debated as to who and how many. Um, and I think that's real key. And it's, it's been the history of the United States. We have never just like, hey, whoever gets here, gets here. And so um, do you buy into the United States of America? Do you want to live up to its values? Do you understand its civic values, its government formation? Do you understand its culture? And I think that when you select who is eligible for legal immigration, I want to make sure that they're ready to be Americans. Yeah, that's one thing I think it's um, misconstrued a lot whenever people talk about this. My personal opinion is like legal immigration. We have some of the best and the brightest all over the world that want to be here. And that's such an advantage to staying, you know, the best country, the greatest country. Uh, I think if it's done, to your point, I think if it's, if it's done the right way, I think it's a huge asset for us. Next question. Do you think school libraries should have stories that include the mention of alternative lifestyles? Well, uh, we have to, <laughs> we, we, we have to, um, we have to talk about what school libraries. So elementary school, hell no, no. Um, you know, e e middle school. I, I mean, I don't think middle school is an appropriate time. And you didn't say in the classroom. So I want to respect the way you asked the question when you said like, these are just available books in the school library, but 
I don't, I don't think that these alternative lifestyles need to be things that are preached to our children, even in middle school. And once you arrive at high school, you're still at a point where it's like, like, what's the difference? What's the line between, and we've clearly passed that line, but if we're attempting to redraw the line between acknowledgement and endorsement, you know, um, celebration and tolerance. Th these are all lines that we have completely blurred. I mean, I don't think, well, I'm sure I don't think we celebrate any form of sexuality at elementary or middle school level. I'm not even sure high school level. Now you could say, Oh, well, you know, the prom and dating and it's all part of the culture of high school. And I get that, but those aren't closed off to people who have different choices. So the constant celebration of an alternative lifestyle is becoming pretty indistinguishable from an endorsement. Okay. Next, should Texas be able to ban abortions without exception or with which exceptions and why? Well, because you asked the question in terms of Texas, I'm going to take the question on the level that you asked it. You didn't ask personally what I believe or, or anything like that one way or the other. Um, I think it's one of the hardest questions um, for anyone as an individual or a society to answer. And because it's one of the hardest questions, we as a society have decided the way to answer the hardest questions is through representative democracy, through republic. And we have to accept the majority opinion of our neighbor. So for example, overturning Roe v. Wade returns that question to democracy that we're saying, we're not going to leave one of those hardest questions to nine, you know, elders in black robes. We're going to leave that to the people to answer democratically. And so if Texas chooses democratically that that's the position they want to have in Texas, no abortion, no exceptions, then I think that's the right answer for Texas. If New York or California decide they want to have unfettered abortion, then that's the right answer for California. It doesn't mean it's the right answer for every individual in that society, um, in that state. But I think it's the most, I actually think it's the most virtuous way to answer the most difficult questions that face a people. I don't think any one person or nine people have the wisdom necessary to make that decision for the rest of the 330 million people. He's going right for the jug there here, Will. <laughs> I didn't, <laughs> he's asking, that he's putting you on the spot so you probably feel at home. It's all right. Yeah, I said I like the fire. <laughs> Next question. Is Israel justified in its prosecution of the war in Gaza? Why or why not? Yes, I think that Israel is because clearly Hamas is their enemy and you don't 80% destroy an enemy. You 100% destroy an enemy. You know, I'm not sure exactly when our conversation will be published, but at the time of recording, we're one day away from the, um, the 80th anniversary of D-Day, the landing on Normandy. And I visited that a week ago with my kids. And one of the things that struck me is the staggering amount of casualties. And I'm way deep on a rabbit hole right now when it comes to World War II. I'm learning about the Battle of Stalingrad, the Eastern Front, um, and the staggering number of casualties. And you know what nobody talks about? The civilian casualties. I think China lost 20 million people in World War II to the Japanese and starvation. The Soviet Union lost close to 20 million people. Civilians, we're not even talking about army. The sad truth of war is that civilians die. That's what happens. You can't find me the war where it doesn't happen. We've evolved into modern warfare trying to reduce that. Um, and we don't do wars of attrition so much anymore where we throw bodies at a war, um, at least for the time being. But that is the true nature of war. We, we're deluding ourselves if we think it is not. You have to destroy your enemy. You destroy your enemy 100%. And there will be civilian casualties along the way. So are they justified? Yes, because they're, they have an enemy who is trying to destroy them in Hamas. Now, that doesn't mean that I personally don't look at the plight of the Palestinian people and say, wow, this is not a good, this is not a good situation. And I do. Um, I don't know what the long-term solution for the coexistence of the Israelis and the Palestinians are. Um, but I know that also when it comes down to it, 
human beings are inherently tribal. And if one tribe is trying to destroy another tribe, it's zero sum existence. It's a win lose proposition. And Israel is currently in that situation and you have to destroy your enemy. And the final question, should there be a death penalty? Please explain your answer. Well, Tim, these are the meanest questions anyone's ever asked me from abortion to Israel to the death penalty. <laughs> you might as well um, you, you drive a hard bargain here, straight to the heart. So mean I had to have a set change. I had some technical difficulties in my studio, so I had to switch to my phone. Um, so I've had an evolution on the death penalty. I would say earlier in my life I was um, pro-death penalty, supportive of the death penalty. Um, for reasons I think of justice and, and, you know, Tim, I know you're a lawyer and you went to law school and you learned there are like five reasons for punishment, you know, rehabilitation, retribution is actually a legitimate rationale for punishment. Um, you know, separation from society. But I told you earlier, my movement towards conservatism, and it's kind of interesting as I moved that direction, conservative and, and sort of libertarian, I moved away from the death penalty because I know I became very skeptical of government. I know it's not infallible and I know they can make a mistake and really bothers me to see a mob, you know, gang up on one person. Um, it always has. So I think there's nothing more powerful. There's no bigger mob than the government. Um, and if a person is innocent, and you send them to the death penalty, I can think of no greater injustice. Of course, it's not a mob. It's, it's, it's a system of government, a system of justice. Um, and I think that I've come back around to being supportive of the death penalty. I just, I think it does work as deterrence. I don't care what people say or what the latest studies are. I mean, I think it is a deterrence. I think society has a rightful um, right to retribution. And I think it serves a useful purpose. And so today I would say, yes, I am supportive of the death penalty. <laughs> the zoom in, the zoom in on your face to say you're supportive of the death penalty too is, is, uh, we really, we picked a bad time to set, set change. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Troy? Is Will's home CNN or Fox News? <laughs> if he likes being in the fire, he probably should be at CNN, but. <laughs> No, it's, it's, uh, the funny thing about Will and Will, we've known each other for all of, you know, an hour here, but it seems like where you are actually doesn't even matter. You're, you're kind of unapologetically you. No, I and appreciate it. It happens, it happens to, you know, a couple of the places, a couple of your last stops professionally, <laughs> you've been the minority and now you're, you know, now you're not, but you know, yeah, it's, you. it's actually, it's refreshing to see. It's refreshing to hear as somebody who, you know, I watch the news, obviously, and watch uh, ESPN. Uh, I think people prefer. I I I speak um, in my own opinion. I guess people prefer when political stuff is out of the sports arena. But if it's there, it's nice to have representation on both sides. Even exactly, if, you know, whether you agree with it or don't agree with it. I think having the conversations, um, not having the conversations, is part of the reason why the country's so polarized today. Totally agree. Couldn't pay me a better compliment than to say I'm myself in whichever environment. And the pl truth is, places like CNN, they don't have that debate anymore. You know, and I'm I'm afraid. I don't know if they do at ESPN. So this is why I'm excited. Like I am home at Fox because they have embraced me and they have given me a platform and they've given me another platform in my digital show, the Will Cain Show, where I have embraced that fire and that debate. Um, and so, and so, Tim, I'm home at Fox. Will, it's becoming a bit of a tradition for my final question to be, would you like to brag a little bit about your two fine young kids? <laughs> yeah, I would. You know, it's, uh, I talk about them sometimes. I do. And I've put them on TV. It's like one of those things, like how far do you go in sharing the lives of people who are not you? when you're in this job, because I made the choice, right? I made the choice to be public. They didn't make the choice, but I couldn't be more proud. The most proud thing I've ever been a part of in being my, in my life is being a father. Um, and they are incredible. I just took them to France and they had to listen to me monologue about history and listen to eye-wateringly boring history podcasts about World War II. <laughs> 
and not a single complaint. They trekked around Paris in the rain with their mom and me to see a museum or whatever, and not a single complaint. And they love sports like I love sports. My greatest joy is watching them play sports. And, and if I'm being real, I put entirely too much on it. Like, you know, I, I don't put that much on academics and it makes me proud. They take that ball and run with it without me having to push them. And they're good people. That's my main thing. They're good. They're good dudes. <clears throat> All three of us know what that means. You've been around guys. No, no, he's a good dude. When you say that about somebody, you know what I mean. Um, and you know, you've said it about people. I love the men they're on their way to becoming. I'm incredibly proud of my boys. Will, I'm going to get you the last, my last question because my dad always uh, tries to cut me off before I get to it. So one of the things that was important with us with this whole podcast, the whole show is to talk to people of just different backgrounds. It didn't have to be anything about ALS or sports or media or books, which, you know, with my dad's background, I think it'd be easy for us to get pigeonholed into that. It was just to talk to interesting people and uh, hear all different kinds of stories. So I always end, the, my last question is always, um, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Who, who are a couple of people you know that you think uh, we should try to get on the podcast and tell their story? And Wow. <laughs> Open-ended questions are always the hardest. Can we go back to the death penalty? <laughs> um, I think somebody once asked me like who I'd like to have dinner with, you know, and I wouldn't say it's still the same, but like alive, you know, um, my celebrity dinner party. And Tim, you may know him. I don't, I don't know. And I know him a little bit. We've talked on the phone a few times, but I, I think Charles Barkley is fascinating. I, I I don't agree with him on everything, but I don't care because he's authentic. He's who he is. Um, I'm a big fan of Charles Barkley. I don't know if he's a fan of me. He, at one time, he was a fan of me. Now, he's not a big fan of Fox. I don't know if he would be a fan anymore, but I still, doesn't matter. I still am a fan of Charles Barkley. Um, I think Tucker Carlson is a fascinating person. Um, I think you guys should get Joe Rogan. Turn the tables on him. You know, find out some things about Joe Rogan. Uh, I think there's some, pr some pretty fascinating people that I would certainly love to hear you guys talk to. Will Kane, thank you for your time. It's been a real pleasure to get to know you. You have such a rich and rewarding life, and you are only halfway through. May God continue to bless you and your family. Well, thank you guys. Um, I saw Brian Kilmeade on your show, and I'm, I heard him say this, and I thought, spot on. I'm honored to have been asked. Um, you know, you're, you're an inspiration, Tim. And, um, you know, it's just incredibly impressive to, you know, we talked a lot about my trials or whatever. I, they're nothing, you know, comparatively. And I just think the achievement, the spirit, um, it's incredibly inspiring. And I appreciate you allowing me to be around you for an hour and a half. Thanks so much, Will. It was really great, great to uh, get to know you. Thanks, guys. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barkley Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to BarkleyDamon.com. I want to thank my partners at Barkley Damon for supporting this podcast and of course Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you liked today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com. For cutting edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital, if you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.